Thanks. Um, just wanted to, um, uh, specifically to, to Brenton and Jim, um, the execution of your business and, and how have you identified uh, what consumers want in your markets? And how, how have you sort of found out what, could, what your target market wants? If you go first, Brenton. So, so our, our business, David, is uh, we're a bulk processor uh, marketer, but um, I guess you know, for us it's all about hitting that uh, product consistency and, and, sticking, and sticking with the market. So, so markets go up and down uh, as far as returns go, but um, I think in the past Australia's been highly criticised for jumping in and out of markets. So um, yeah, just having that, that dedication to that market and making sure every container is the same as the one that's just been delivered. So, so product quality uh, is really important for us, and that's our, our um, you know, difference probably on a global stage, is that, is that we uh, challenge ourselves to, to, to put almonds in its various product forms to the highest specifications, and we get a little bit more money for that, but it is, is um, just becoming that supplier of choice. So, so we just keep fronting up and um, you know, listen to the customer. And uh, a bit like Jim, I think it's really important that you understand who your customer is and what they use the product for. And you can <coughs> generally come up with uh, some really good solutions on maybe saving them some money by using a different type of almond product or a variety of almond or, or size of almond. So, so um, uh, our business, we... we deal directly with the customer. We don't sell to, through any trading house. Um, it's all a, a, a direct relationship with the, with the customer. Thanks, Brendan. Jim? Yeah, people know more about food than ever. So if you give them something that, you know, in the case of corn, if you give them something that tastes poorly, you just don't get the return sales. When we, get over, when we go overseas, a lot of the corn that's grown is grown in, in different climates, and it's generally quite different to what we have. So unless, and it looks pretty much the same, but unless um, you, you have a point of difference that tastes better, then it doesn't mean much. So labelling is very important, and obviously you've got to tell them that the difference is in the taste. So that, that, they're, they're, they're the most important things. So we've got some questions. Thanks, David. Uh, Stephen Lynch from Horticulture Innovation. I guess the question for both Jim and Nicola um, touched on a couple of things, and I want to relate it back to this morning's conversation about uh, investments. Um, Jim, you talked about two things. You, you go up north and presume on a relative basis your land and water is somewhat cheap up there by current standards, but you mentioned the labour problem. And, uh, Nicola, I think in intensification, we're seeing some already here in, in blueberries and raspberries, for instance. And uh, the other thing in, in your intensive area, I'm not sure if you touched on, uh, you may correct me, is uh, we're seeing here, but a lot more in US and Europe, is robotics, which, which partly tackles the labour issue. So it's a, it's a kind of combined question that, uh, uh, Jim, do you see your corn ever going completely intensive into your hydroponics business? And, and uh, w w where does robotics fit in, obviously, in the process? But I think if you, if you then encompass all of that, the challenge we have is uh, the investment, as we're seeing it, say, in our tomato people, if you take, say, Costas or one of the other groups that have got 60, 80 million dollars in, in high <coughs> with with some robotics. Um, they are big investments, um, and uh, our horticulture innovation CEO was just in the US, uh, and he was talking about major global companies like Monsanto are investing in those areas. So. How do we capture the investment and from this morning the investment model to go intensive and where do robotics and labour fit into making that into, into a package leading on from where you both are now? You can, sure, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can just touch on a little bit. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a great one on the, knowing everything about what's happening in the robotics, but I do know that they are... Um, already designing blue, uh, well, they are actually trying to breed blueberry bushes for mechanical harvesting and the better tasting, bigger size. Um, interesting enough, the, the, one of the top breeders worldwide is actually here in Australia, but he sees the future in outdoor, but, you know, it's, it's compromising because I see the future in intensive un, undercover, but it's getting those machines to the size to get into the structures to be able to do, 
you know, to do the harvesting properly. But, you know, you look at um, how tractors used to be, and I'm not sure if you've all got those little John Deere lawn mowers. You know, you can get different sizes of tractors, and that will happen with the machinery, I think, in the berry industry for harvesting berries indoors, <coughs> especially blueberries, because they're a little bit more hardy. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a hard one because a lot of the, there's a, there's a variety of raspberry that is actually already harvested man, um, mechanically, but that's only for um, processing and for the, you know, so the machinery needs to be really um, a little bit more delicate and um, I, I personally don't think for the raspberries and the blackberries, blackberries probably a little bit more quicker because they're a little bit more hardy than raspberries, but I don't see the soft, soft fruit taking on the mechanical harvesting for the fresh market just yet. But I think the blueberries will be in the next five, ten years. There will be something come through for intensive cropping. Um, to go towards your tomato picking and stuff like that, I'm probably not qualified to be able to tell you what's actually happening in that sphere. But I can see it happening. Yeah, the, <coughs> it's simple for me. The labour thing is not going to go away. Um, I just came back from Berlin to look at this, the, the world's best uh, standards of robotics. For me, they're, they're, a way, they're a ways off. Um, we don't have a choice. I don't think the industry has a choice, but to, to look at those sorts of things. But they are, they are way off. If you're asking me what I focus my business on outside of, uh, of developing my product, it's got to be trying to save on labour, look at better ways, more efficient ways of mechanising everything. So it's not going away and I, we don't really have a choice. So. I look for best um, industry standards, world standards, if I can. For me, they're still in their infancy. For me, I, I felt that I, I spoke to the people <clears throat> that, are, uh, that, are, that are at the highest point of, of um, robotics for what I do, and they're still not there yet. So I'll be there. I'll be the first one knocking on their door when they get it right, trust me. Michael Clark, agronomist <coughs> and amateur beekeeper. You, uh, you had an issue with um, pollination in 2016. Almond crop's going to be a bit down. Can you elaborate on that? Is it it's just, bees or? I can't say it's poor bees. But uh, <laughs> no, it was just uh, timing, just weather, essentially. Um, so pollination period, a bit like Nick, Nicky was saying, um, you know, bees are a vital part of, of how the crop gets uh, produced currently. Um, so bee pollination uh, happens uh, around that August, September time, and we need generally good weather for bees to get out there and strut their stuff. And, and it, was just, it was just cold and, and um, had some showery weather activity and the bees, like most of us, will stay indoors and not go out and pollinate as good as what they can. So, so um, you know, as I said, the, the you know, game-changing on a nursery point of view is that, that bees will become less reliant as the industry goes through its next level of expansion because there's self-fertile varieties which are now available to, to growers. Is that commercial as uh, self-pollinating Yeah, absolutely, yep. yep. So there's been um, reasonable plantings in Australia really last year and this year in the planting period and certainly uh, significant uptake in California. Which, which changes the whole harvest. Most people might, may not know, there's about 16 or 18 different varieties, 17 of those are pollinating varieties. So almonds are harvested by individual variety. So if you had one variety, not only is it better, it's more, a little bit cheaper because you've got reduced pollination cost, um, but on a harvesting point of view, it's, it's uh, gonna minimize cost a fair bit. Seems Yeah, look, and they are all the myths that, that have been broken in California over the last probably five or six years. So there's orchards there that have got signs up, they've got no bees allowed. Now, that's, that's how confident they are that pollination is not required on those varieties. But again, we're, and we're going through that same dilemma in Australia now is, is um, do you really need, you know, bees really need to still pollinate something? Um, so we'll wait and see. So they've been planted at the moment, so we'll see how that turns out. It's been positive for, for the US. Shane, is 
Australia learned from New South Wales DPI. Um, over the last decade, we've seen this is a question for Brent exponential growth in the nut industries, particularly almonds. Um, Brian highlighted the fact that you know, prices at the moment are static or um, we've got significant international players now moving into the almond industry, um, particularly in the river arena. Um, what's the industry's potential? How big can you go? I think I think it's all going to come down to water um, you know, and, and suitable land, you know, soil types. So. Um, there certainly will be a, a reasonable increase in uh, hectares planted in 2016, 17, 18, because there's, there's uh, reasonable nursery orders over that period. But it's like, it'll be similar to pattern from, from uh, almonds are hot at the moment, and you know, five years' time or six years' time, it may not be as, as hot. So it'll be going through that cycle of, of um, planting now and taking a bit of a pause later. But um, water is going to be the crucial factor, and I, you know, almonds do deliver a good return on your water use, and uh, one of the highest ones. And I think farming's uh, changed from that land use. And Nicky's onto it. <laughs> we don't need soil the way we utilise it now to grow crops, but um, water is still such a crucial input, and people need to get a return on that investment if they're going to make it. It's Anthony Kachenko from Port Innovation. Um, I've got a yeah. question for Brian. Uh, the non-edible sector represents about 20% of the gross value of production. And I'm just wondering if you can provide some perspective from ABES in terms of any trends or opportunities in that sector. And I do have a second question for Nikki, if I may. David, get two for the price of one. Um, I'm just wondering, from your um, in travels with the Nuffield Scholarship, what were two or three key things that you took brought back to your business that you plan to implement in the, the short or, or near future? Okay, so you get things. I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch what you said. The, the what sector represents? Sure, the, the non-edible sector, so turf, nursery and so on, represents about 20% of farm gate value. Right. So I'm just wondering on behalf of ABES, if there's any perspective you might be able to add in terms of trends or opportunities in that sector. Um, no, unfortunately, I mean, we concentrate on fruit and vegetables and nuts and we don't look very much at that other sector. Um, you know, it's been declining over a period of time and we've sort of continued the... Uh, our, ..continued the trend down in our calculations, but uh, it's not something we study in any detail. I, I, I mean, I understand that, it, you know, it's, it's sort of declining well, partly because of changes in, in, in housing, because there's more people living in apartments and they don't go to the nursery and buy plants the way people with backyards do, but um, it's, it's not something we study. Okay, you asked me what we changed directly in our own business. Um, the first thing I can tell you about that was really, um, we, we, we started to diversify, so generally most farmers tend to be monoculture or so we had just blueberries in the one greenhouse when as soon as we came back we actually were planting um, raspberries strawberries we started integrating with citrus um, passion fruit figs all around the outsides of our greenhouse were inside but on the outskirts to give our bees a little bit more diversity to increase their um, bee health um, we grow in a greenhouse and um, the first thing we were taught put your be um, beehives facing the east which was just simple stuff that we didn't know about and the other thing was just putting up landscapes because the UV um, affects you know is affecting the the radar of the bees so we've got big landscapes like triangles and circles in our greenhouses and our bees get around really we don't have them you know sometimes you go to a greenhouse where they've got bees they, they go to the the roof and then they all just can't get out and they all just die we don't have that happening anymore um, the, probably the biggest thing I, I, which keeps me awake a little bit at night is the spotted wing Drosophila. Um, that was a huge thing that was affecting the rest of the world and the berry industry. If we get that on our shores, we're in like some really big trouble. So, and the other thing was market access. I, I, it was another thing that keeps me up at night. You know, these these beautiful trade agreements that we can get, but it can actually change. And the other thing, and other countries can get great access to our markets. So. You know, the growers here need to really be, you know, be really thinking ahead. 
um, you know, like the Chileans and their, their berry production is so, so incredibly sleek. If they get access to our markets, you know, a lot of the berry industry in Australia will be under a bit of pressure. So we came back and we've diversified our business. So we're trying other things like turmeric, garlic, um, ginger, um, things that we can produce and supply. We are small grower and small growers will only be able to survive if we have a diverse range that we can offer customers in our local area or do the markets. The big growers will be the ones that's doing the supermarkets. That's where I think. So that's where I feel. And I keep giving advice to small growers saying, listen, if you want to do something, diversify your portfolio, find something new. John. Nikki, John Wallace of Map on Pair Australia. I'm just wondering in your travels whether you saw any sizable glass houses that today might, or a few years down the track, might enable even orchards to come into a glass house environment. Or there are obviously savings in pest management, water usage. We're already spending $100,000 a hectare in risk mitigation. Are we 10 years away from potentially being able to grow apples and pears and Avocados indoor. I, I do think. I, I honestly, if, hand on heart, I, I think it's happening and it's going to happen quite quickly. Um, I'm sure the first stage will be putting things under just plastic tunnels. I believe, and I saw it on Twitter or something today, that there's some cherries going under glass or under greenhouse in Tasmania. So that's the first step. And uh, when the cherries do it, and it's going to start with the high value products first: avocados, cherries, figs, mangoes. Um, but then it's a matter of time of people finding um, a special peach or plum, the, the Queen Garnet or something has got some great properties. Those are the things that are really precious that will, you know, people will be able to do the sums and see the big glass houses going in. In terms of greenhouses, I've seen them really big. As you, we see here already, there's 10 hectares, 20 hectares being put in one blocks. Talk about tall greenhouses, I saw the tallest greenhouse in the world. So, you know, if you think you're limited just to, you know, mangoes, which you can actually trellis down, I think we're wrong. You could probably put a few almonds in as well and you can get yeah. some height. So um, I do see that being the way forward. Um, and the thing is, is that you don't need lots of land and to get the same sort of yields. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that, especially, you know, but I think that land will be more precious used for things that it needs to be used for. Some of our high value crops can be put under cover and glass and retractables so that you can actually, you know, the retractable greenhouses to me, I've got a great thing because you actually get sun, sunlight in. it actually, you know, affects the, the half life of some of the fungal spores. Um, you know, it also you can sometimes um, get hardier, stronger leaves so you don't get, you know, crops getting soft and susceptible to disease. So I hope that answers your question. Who's it to? I know. So who's it to, Stuart? Doesn't matter. 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 Well, what I said during my speech was, <coughs> and Barnaby Joyce said it uh, earlier today, we are high cost producers. So now's the time. You know, the Australian dollar may stay low for a long time, but we've got to get in there and consolidate on the market. Um, that's, that's the way I see it. So at the moment, from my company, I'm trying to be very strategic about where I'm going, try to get into the market now. If the currency changes, then try and get a foot in there. You want to answer the one on, um, might be more your bag, being in almonds? <coughs> Super. I think there's, yeah, um, I'm not sure how that's all going to play out. Really, this, this still seems to be a reluctance from particular super area to invest in agriculture. I think that was those questions were covered pretty well this morning about you know the fact there's less than one percent invested in there currently. Um, certainly we're getting a lot more overseas super funds or 
um, superannuation funds investing in the particular arm industry, that's for sure. There's, there's been a number of acquisitions over the last uh, two years um, in that area. You know, I thought, uh, export's such a, you can have a really good export market, but it can be, it can change overnight on a, on a um, simple label requirement in that country, or there's always hurdles that you've got to um, overcome. Uh, you know, the fact that we're a fairly large exporter, and I think the whole fee structure that's just been changed over the last six or nine months uh, might make it easier for, or more incentive to, to provide assistance to a smaller exporter, but the big exporters are getting higher fees and charges for whether it's export documentation or certificates or you know, that whole process. So, so I always get a little bit confused, Stuart, when government says one thing and as an exporter or a processor, you're getting smacked with all these different costs that weren't there two years ago. So, um, you, know, and I, you know, we're talking about robotics and innovation, but there's no, there's no incentive for business you either do it yourself, which you probably should be doing anyway, but you know, all grant money is all about employing somebody. But to be efficient, you need to be investing in other things and people. Simple as that. Uh, can I just add in there, and this is just from my perspective as well, is that sometimes with the investment in the superannuation funds, they want guaranteed returns, and um, you know, sometimes you know, agriculture is you know, previously been quite, historically been quite risky. And that's why, go back to my protected cropping, um, you know, we're starting to, in these beautiful big closed or semi-closed greenhouses, you know, your, your risks are mitigated to uh, quite extensively unless you get a hailstorm. But um, that sort of thing I think would be attractive and the scale that they're talking and the volumes of turn, return on investment um, you look at these big projects going up 10, 20 hectares at a time. I can tell you this now. There's no one investing in that type of money if they do not know that their return is positive. So whether it's competitive with a super, um, shopping centres or with you know, aged care, I don't know. But I think at the end of the day, you know, investors have got to take us seriously because we're going to need to be fed. And if they want to, uh, you know, to have a slice of the pie, they need to be, you know, put their money where their mouth is. So th thank you. And we'll wrap up there. And, and Brian, you, you've laid out the, the roadmap for us, double digit, close to double digit growth, that, that's pretty good. And the, the, the uh, other three growers have clearly targeted the right market and done the right deals. They're nice. obviously adaptive and, uh, and responsive to market changes and they focus on their margins. So with that, I'd like us all to uh, uh, thank, thank our uh, panel appropriately. Well,